My name is Pamela Smith. I'm the director of the Center for Science and Society in which the Presidential Scholars for Society and Neuroscience is housed and supported. And I'm chair of the program. And we are absolutely thrilled to see you all here and to um, have our annual research symposium in person with our second year students. Uh, students, I keep, I never forget, stop calling them students, our second year postdocs. Um, and it's just great to have you here in person and to all of you on Zoom. We are also have everybody here on Zoom. Welcome. Um, today we're going to hear from our three presidential scholars, um, our second years, Rafael Miliere and uh, Valerio Amaretti. And we'll also hear from Claire McCormick, who finished the program in December and is giving her farewell um, presentation. Uh, and uh, we're going to, um, after each of these uh, scholars speak and tell us a little bit about their progress and their, pro their project, um, we're going to hear from our faculty mentors who all play a really crucial role in the PSSN program. They guide their research pr um, projects, they help them navigate the academic landscape and give them a lot of feedback. Um, you may know that the um, PSSN program is searching for new scholars, a new cohort um, who, would, who will be appointed this summer. And the steering committee has already selected five finalists out of a really highly competitive pool. And they are joining us today virtually and we'll be interviewing them tomorrow. So I want to wish them all good luck in their interviews this week. So um, just before I introduce all the speakers, I'd like to just say um, uh, just a couple of words about the program for those of you who are new here or aren't joining on Zoom and haven't um, been at our events before. Uh, this uh, uh, Presidential Scholars in Society and Neuroscience program facilitates cross-disciplinary collaborative research to advance our understanding of mind, brain, and behavior. And it brings together talented early career scholars from various fields with faculty experts in neuroscience and in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. The core of our program are our early career postdoctoral scholars. They pursue, pursue independent research at the intersection of neuroscience and the arts, humanities, and social sciences. Each scholar receives tailored support. You can see the, um, report, the support that they receive from their mentors um, from at least two different departments. They help guide their um, research. They have the relevant expertise. And you can see that they come from neuroscience, from sociology, from psychology, English and comp lit, and many other disciplines. The scholars and PSSN faculty are central in organizing interdisciplinary events, events um, and we hope that you will, whoops, there they all are. We hope that you will um, sign up for our newsletter and um, uh, so that you can see our upcoming events. We also, of course, are on social media and you can find us there. So for those of you on Zoom, if you'd like to participate in today's event, you can um, submit questions at any time using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. Um, and for those of you in the room, hey, you know, if you remember what to do, you can just raise your hand and I will, I will call on you. Um, so uh, we'll have a little bit of time for questions after each of the um, scholars speaks and the mentors. Um, give their feedback. And with that, I am going to turn it over um, to Raphael Miliere, but I first want to introduce Raphael, um, who is in his second year, as um, you know. And he is, um, he received his PhD in 2020 from the University of Oxford where he developed a pluralist account of self-consciousness grounded in novel empirical evidence collected in, collaborate, in collaboration with neuroscientists. As a presidential scholar, he investigates theoretical and empirical issues regarding spatial self-representation using virtual reality. He's also interested in the human-like capacities of artificial deep neural networks with a particular focus on the semantic competence of neural language models. 
Welcome, Raphael. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Pamela, for this introduction. It does feel like a real privilege to be all together in person after two years. In fact, I, I realize today that I haven't been in this very room uh, since I first came two years ago for the interviews. Uh, so it is, it is a real treat. Um, so today I want to present um, some of my research as a presidential scholar. Um, as someone who works at the crossroads between philosophy and cognitive science, I have two main research programs, as Pamela mentioned. Um, one is about the nature and the scope of self-representation. Uh, what makes it so that we can represent ourselves as ourselves? What are the building blocks of this kind of representation? How is it integrated with perception, memory, uh, um, and action? And I am also interested uh, in the capacities of neural networks, of so-called connectionist models. Um, but this is not what I will be talking about today. So uh, today my talk uh, uh, is uh, embedded under the, uh, the first uh, heading. So specifically, I want to uh, share some thoughts about uh, what it means to feel present in an environment and how that might relate to some philosophical discussions about self-representation. So if you take a second to look around and ask yourself whether you feel present in that lecture hall, uh, for those of you who are with me here in person, uh, the answer seems obviously yes, you do feel present here. For those of us who are following this uh, uh, event on, on Zoom or uh, online, uh, presumably you do not feel present in that lecture hall. So we can uh, sharpen that difference a little bit by extending this example to consider three, exper three different experiences. Uh, looking at a lecture hall in which you are actually present, actually situated, um, looking at a picture or video of a lecture hall, or picturing that lecture hall in your head. And one of these is not like the others. The first one, as I just mentioned, seems to be the only one where you, are, uh, you really feel present in the environment. And presumably this contrast is not just a matter of judgment or belief, or not just a matter of believing that you're present in the lecture hall. There seems to be something more, something in your experience, uh, that makes you feel present in that environment. So how can we spell out that difference in more detail? Well, the first step is to um, take a look at uh, the structure of perception, and I will specifically focus on visual perception uh, in that talk. So ordinary visual experiences have this quality, this st structure, we can say that they are perspectival in the sense that they represent the environment and landmarks, objects in the environment, uh, from a particular point of view, from a particular perspective. And uh, more than that, they are egocentric because the point of view from which landmarks are represented uh, is tied to the location of one's own body, right? It's this kind of visual perception specifically to the location of one's head. Um, and so that's something we can specify from a geometrical perspective uh, by saying that uh, the visual system represents the location of uh, objects and landmarks in the environment in uh, an egocentric frame of reference, which is a geometrical uh, notion that refers to a specific coordinate system uh, centered onto a point of origin, roughly in the middle of the head, beh behind the eyes, um, from which we can represent uh, the direction and the distance uh, of objects in the environment, roughly. Um, so this is uh, simplifying how this works, but essentially if you, have, uh, if you are looking at an apple, we can uh, represent this apple as being at a certain distance to the right of your visual field. And we know now from research in neuroscience that there are dedicated uh, populations of neurons in the brain of various animals, and presumably humans as well, uh, that uh, represent this kind of information in an egocentric frame of reference. So again, coming back to our example, uh, images, when you look at an image, uh, images can be perspectival without being egocentric because uh, they have a perspective, they are taken from a specific point of view, but this, not, this does not coincide with your own uh, perspective on the world, right? Uh, it coincides with the, uh, where the camera was situated when the picture was taken. Now, when you imagine a scene in your head, then that is both perspectival, that can be both perspectival and egocentric. You can imagine things from a first person perspective. Yet both of these experiences, as we've just seen, seem to lack the sense of being present in the environment, uh, depicted on the image or imagined in your head. And so something else seems to be required to really uh, uh, feel present uh, in an environment. So I will just briefly go through th three conditions in which people report feeling, either feeling present in an environment that is not their actual environment, so in a virtual environment, 
or not feeling present in an environment that is their real environment. So in the case of dreaming, um, it is often, it often reported that dreams feel very immersive. We are immersed in them. We feel as if we were really present in the environment uh, of dreams. And so that has been noted by a number of people, but here is a passage from uh, a dream researcher and philosopher called Jennifer Vint, who contrasts daydreams with actual dreams during sleep. Uh, and she says, when we are lost in vivid daydream and imagine experiencing events from an internal point of view, ongoing perceptual and bodily experience prevent us from feeling fully present in these imaginary worlds. By contrast, even passive observer dreams are immersive. They involve a phenomenal here and are experienced from an internal first-person perspective in a more robust sense related to the phenomenology or the experience of being present in our environment. So we can feel present in virtual environments in dreams. Uh, we can also seemingly feel present in virtual environments uh, using this technology called virtual reality. Uh, so using a head-mounted display that displays two different images, one for the left, one for, one for the right eye, uh, we can uh, produce this illusion of being present in a virtual environment that has also been named in VR research the sense of presence. So here are some examples of how uh, uh, virtual reality researchers talk about this sense of presence in, in VR. Uh, the sense of presence is the sense of being in a virtual environment rather than the place in which the participant's body is actually located. Uh, or here is another uh, definition. The sense of presence is the illusion of being there, there in the virtual environment, notwithstanding that you know for sure that you are not. So again, this idea that this is not simply a matter of belief. People know very well that they are not actually in this virtual environment, and yet they feel tricked by this setup. Uh, there is this illusory component to it. So it seems that we can feel present in environments in which we are not really embedded. Uh, but we uh, can also seemingly uh, fail to feel present in the actual, our actual environments in some pathological cases. So here is an example from this cluster of syndromes, psychiatric syndromes, uh, commonly called deralization, depersonalization. Uh, where patients report not really feeling uh, present in their environments anymore. So here are some examples of reports that patients can give that are typical. I'm not here, I don't feel present. Uh, through the eyes I look out at the world that may be a picture of the world. Um, and finally, the people and things around you seem as unreal to you as if you were only dreaming about them. Now this final one it might seem a little bit confusing given the which, what we've just seen about dreams, that dreams are usually immersive, they're usually uh, feel as if you were present in the dream environment. So that alerts us to uh, the possibility that when people talk about being present in different uh, conditions, feeling present in an environment, they might mean slightly different things. And so that's what I want to suggest now, that we would gain from distinguishing between uh, different ways in which my, one might construe the sense of presence. Um, so the first one is what I call here spatial immersion. And by this, I refer to the sense of feeling present within a given space, uh, such that you are uh, connected to that space. This feels like the space in which your body is embedded. Um, and so when you look at a picture, uh, clearly the depicted space does not feel connected uh, from, uh, to, your, to your own space. And similarly, when you imagine an object, like if I imagine an apple in front of me, uh, the, the space uh, uh, in which this imagined apple is does not feel connected uh, of a piece, as it were, with the, the space around me, the environment that I can see and perceive. Whereas in dreams or in virtual reality, it seems that the virtual space typically feels like one's own space in uh, normal conditions. Uh, it feels of a piece with a space in which one's body is embedded. So what is required to feel spatially immersed in an environment like this? Um, well, here are some uh, speculative proposals. So first, we need to represent the location of the landmarks in that space in an egocentric frame of reference. But as we've seen, that's, that's perhaps not sufficient. Um, and so it seems that we also need those representations to be responsive adequately to uh, uh, signals about our own movements, to motor and proprioceptive signals, um, uh, so, such that there is this congruency between our own movements and what we see in the space around us. Uh, when I picture an apple, if I turn my head, uh, I will not see uh, or not experience the apple moving to the left uh, as it would if I was just actually seeing an apple uh, in front of me. 
But there are researchers talking about the sense of presence uh, in the philosophy of perception, people like Mohan Matten um, and Michael Barkasi, who have um, defined the sense of presence in a slightly different way that emphasizes the capacity to interact with the environment a bit more. And so here they mean something, I think, that it's a, bit, a little bit different. It's the sense that landmarks and objects in one's environment are available for action. Uh, as uh, uh, Machen puts it, they have this ergonomic significance. So the objects are experienced as graspable, or the obstacles are as avoidable, or, or the, 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 the space itself as explorable. Um, and Machen, for example, suggests that uh, the sense of presence so defined um, is driven by uh, the motion guiding visual system that guides bodily actions like uh, reaching for an object or shift shifting one's gaze to look at an environment. Uh, and uh, we have strong reasons to think from research in neuroscience that this is supported by the ventral visual, visual stream in the brain. Um, and so there are uh, reasons that have been proposed to um, to think that uh, what I have called here spatial immersion and motor immersion uh, might come apart in specific cases. So for example, in dreams, uh, there is increasing evidence that dreams are not, as we might think of them, uh, purely disembodied uh, experiences, but are actu actually weakly embodied states. Um, namely, uh, the bodily sensations that we, uh, the stimuli we receive uh, bodily during dreams and the feedback from, from our own movements uh, come to play a role in driving and in modulating uh, the experience we have when we dream. So for example, our position, our bodily position, uh, um, changes the kind of feedback we have from uh, the inner ear, from the vestibular organs, uh, and that influences the content of dreams, and also the, the feedback from uh, the muscle twitches we have during sleep also influences the content of dreams. And in fact, uh, some uh, researchers like Bloomberg and Bean have suggested that some dreams we have in rapid eye movement sleep might be entirely driven by feedback from uh, our own movements, from these twitches that we have automatically during sleep. And in these dreams, the visual representations we have in the dreams, according to this hypothesis, uh, might be built just to fill in the environment on the basis of the feedback from our own movements. And so it seems like in such dreams, uh, the kind of motion-guided vision that I mentioned before that drives uh, motor immersion uh, is not online, is not engaged, right? Uh, because this is the kind of uh, visual system that uh, normally facilitates tracking the external environment uh, when you can interact with it. Um, and yet these dreams are still described as, as immersive. So that might be some tentative uh, 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 evidence, or at least a uh, uh, hypothetical um, um, considerations that, that would lead us to think that uh, perhaps in these cases, uh, spatial immersion comes apart from motor immersion. So uh, these two slightly different ways of uh, components to the sense of presence in perception. And finally, it seems that uh, what's going on with depersonalization, derealization is uh, something different entirely that's not so much perceptual. Uh, and it's the sense that the environment is real in a more affective way. Um, so we can describe this as uh, being akin to what philosophers call a metacognitive feeling. Uh, namely, uh, something that res results from monitoring your own cognition. Um, so, it specifically, it, it, it can be uh, thought of as, as, as the output of an online uh, reality monitoring process where your uh, brain is constantly monitoring cues in your environment to determine uh, uh, whether the environment is real or not. And what's telling is that derealized, depersonalized patients do not have sensory motor impairments, that they perceive the world uh, normally as far as their uh, actual percep perceptual system goes. Um, and yet they report lacking the sense of being present in the environment. Uh, and so, as I just said, this suggests that what they're missing is not spatial or motor immersion as I've defined them, but rather something like this affective sense of reality where everything feels, uh, feels unreal or dreamlike. And so we can connect this back to self-representation now. Um, it seems that egocentric spatial representations and uh, spatial immersion and motor immersion uh, that I have described as these perceptual components of the sense of presence, uh, they seem importantly related to self-representation. Yet, as uh, some philosophers have suggested, like uh, Chris Peacock, one of my mentors, and Susanna Schellenberg, um, 
they may, uh, none of these uh, uh, components seem to uh, strictly require the capacity to represent oneself as oneself, to require self-representation. Namely, you can, you can take all of these things I've described and uh, uh, describe them in purely spatial terms without involving uh, uh, the uh, notion of self-representation. So you can, for example, describe looking at the world from here, where here refers to the egocentric uh, point of origin of the uh, visual spatial perspective, uh, without adding the requirement that this point of origin is represented as being where I am, where you're explicitly building a form of self-representation. So there's this substantive question about how does the self come in into that picture? And so the proposal I have, the tentative proposal that I'm, that I'm working on, uh, among other things, is this idea that self-representation comes in to bridge the kind of spatial egocentric representations required for the sense of presence in perception, for what I described as spatial and motor immersion, with the representation of voluntary movement, self-initiated movement as such, right? So self-representation is involved in differentiating between order-generated and self-generated changes in spatial representations. Um, so you can think of it as uh, representing here, again, the point of origin of the perspective from where the environment is perceived as the location from where such and such movement uh, that I am initiating or can initiate uh, is, is driven, right? And so if there is a distinction between endogenous and exogenous uh, movements, then that brings in uh, self-representation. So it involves the representation of oneself as agent of actual or potential uh, active movements. And so the upshot of this idea is that spatial and motor immersion are not strictly sufficient for self-representation, but uh, of course it is unclear that in adult humans uh, they can really be dissociated, right? So it's, it's unclear that in adult humans who have undergone uh, um, already development, um, we can dissociate uh, this spatial representation from the representation, the representation of oneself. Now I just want to conclude very briefly with uh, the experimental side of this project, um, which uh, my, my thinking has evolved on this, but uh, the way I, I, I see it now is as a way to try to disentangle uh, the different factors that might uh, support uh, respectively spatial and motor immersion in an environment by using virtual reality to manipulate different aspects uh, of one's relation to the environment. And specifically, uh, my, thing, my idea is to manipulate how congruent uh, the movements of one's head uh, is with uh, the visual motion that one uh, gets from the VR headsets in different conditions. Specifically in conditions where one can actively move in the environment, move one's head and sample the environment freely. Uh, cases in which one's uh, head or body is passively moved in the environment such that there is no active self-motion and cases in which there is no self-motion uh, at all where the head stays still. Um, and so I'm currently thinking about how best to uh, design this environment and what kind of uh, behavioral uh, measures to collect and this is an, an ongoing discussion with my mentors. Um, but um, so here is a, is a draft of a virtual environment uh, that I've designed with a colleague uh, at, at NYU. And uh, the idea is that there is this traditional pit paradigm in VR where you're standing on a ledge and looking down at a sharp drop. Uh, and it, you can look at the postural sway, how, mu how much people sway in this, in this case. Um, and I think we can look at that as an implicit measurement of spatial immersion, whether the space fills up a piece with the space in which your body is embodied because depth cues should have relevance for balance if the virtual space is represented as the space in which one's body is embedded. And there's a slightly different stimulus that I've been uh, considering, which is a looming stimulus, an object suddenly coming towards you. And here is there is avoidance behavior from a participant, like a ducking to avoid the stimulus. That seems to be a measurement that is more tightly related to what I call motor immersion. So this idea that you uh, can interact with the environment uh, and uh, um, have uh, significance for action. And so the looming object here has immediate significance for bodily action in, in, the, in, the, in the form of ducking and avoiding the object. And uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much.
Uh, so one of the reasons I was so pleased to see this um, research project is that when you have philosophers who've worked very long time on something and clarity gradually begins to emerge, um, some of the problems in the area can be what J.L. Austin called kicked upstairs. They begin to generate um, empirical, serious hypotheses. This has happened in logic over 100 years, happened in theory of perception. Um, with Raphael's work, it begins to happen in the case of the, of the first person too. These empirical questions that uh, emerge from the conceptual philosophical literature um, can be tackled systematically, experimentally, in all sorts of ways that then, of course, rebound on the philosophy as well. Um, there's many directions in which you could um, move further um, in the direction uh, research that Raphael is pursuing here. Um, he talks about the spatial case, and the spatial case is indeed very fundamental, important in all sorts of ways. Um, but the role of agency in self-representation is also interesting too. So we can conceive of um, a subject who perhaps has got her eyes closed, um, but is just uh, engaged in auditory experience. It's a pure sound world, not binaural, monaural. Um, and perhaps hears a voice, and then you can ask the question, is it the case that if you begin to react with that voice, talk back, you get response that makes sense to your conversation, perhaps that world then begins to seem real as well. The role of agency and perception in generating sense of reality um, is of wide significance. Uh, Raphael's investigating one particular modality, there's other modalities to be investigated too. Um, uh, I hope to see further work in that direction as well. Um, just one very brief final comment. I think I only have only three minutes. Um, there's a huge, long-standing philosophical paradigm um, originating in Raphael's own country from Descartes that starts with, I think, therefore I am. Um, the bodily paradigm that uh, Raphael is talking about gives you a different perspective altogether, and I think we should adopt the general overarching motto here, I act, therefore I am. And that will be it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Peacock. Professor Baldassano? Hey. Uh, so one reason this work is so exciting to me is I, I feel like it pulls together some of the central questions that we'd like to study in cognitive neuroscience. Um, one of these is the way that we represent ourselves in the world and maps of the world. And we know um, there's lots of sophisticated machinery, which some of it has been worked out in rodents, and some of it we're starting to understand in humans as well. Um, how we can understand where we are in, a, in the world. Uh, we know that there's sophisticated mapping that happens when we go into a new room and try to build up these kinds of spatial representations um, of ourselves and our relationships to things in the environment. There's also a separate line of work, uh, which I've been involved in as well, thinking about the way that we can process visual representations of the world and how we can extract information that we need in order to uh, decide how to take actions in the world. And so when we try to process a scene, when we're just looking out at a kind of photographic image, um, we know that the brain builds representations that have to do with things like, what are the actions that I can take here? What are the possible navigational routes that I could take? Where could I walk safely in this environment? Um, even building up to these sort of higher level goals of what kinds of things could I do here? Would this be a good place to have a social event? Would this be a good place to have a lecture? Um, and there's also been uh, a piece of this is thinking about environments that we call reach spaces, meaning um, something like a kitchen counter where there's like potentially many objects that you could interact with um, and thinking about what those possible actions are. Um, and so I think this, this idea of immersion, of spatial and motor immersion um, is an interesting way of thinking about representing not just what actions are possible from this vantage point, but thinking about what actions can I take, right? That bringing together the idea of representing oneself as um, taking voluntary action in this kind of environment. Um, and so we know that these kinds of representations get built by all these different brain systems. Um, and as Raphael mentioned, one way of studying this is things like dreams or these kinds of syndromes where these, uh, the real locations and your sense of presence can get dissociated. But I think this, uh, the development of these sophisticated kinds of VR systems in the past couple of years presents this really interesting opportunity to actually be able to experiment, uh, experimentally manipulate this in the lab very easily. Um, so my lab has been using these, my lab has been using these VR systems um, for things like teaching people spatial maps, which we find can be very effective using these kinds of headsets. Um, and so I'm looking forward to testing the kinds of ideas that Raphael mentioned for thinking about how we can pull together these self-representation ideas along with these voluntary motion ideas. Thank you very much, Professor Walpert. Good, thank you. Um, this on? Okay, so I want to thank Raphael, first of all, for the great talk, very interesting. Um, uh, to me, there are three things which are linked to the sort of ideas I think about in neuroscience. So one thing we think about a lot is how you break down a continuous stream of sensory motor experience into some sort of memories. 
I'm particularly interested in learning motor skills and how through your life do you lay down different skills at different times and then recall them. And what's become very clear in all examples of conditioning, reinforcement learning, motor learning, memory, is that we tag things with context. And one of the strongest forms of context is the room you're in. So if you train an animal in one room, you may unlearn that in a different room and bring it back to the first room, it'll re-express the memory spontaneously. So the presence in a room really has a very strong context and one which we need to understand um, in many ways. So I'm interested in understanding what it means to know you're in a room so you tag that memory. It's also practically important. Often when people have strokes and they go and have rehabilitation with a physiotherapist, they'll have great physiotherapy in the clinic, get better in the clinic, go home, and they won't express any of that behavior outside of the training environment. And again, we think it's the sense of presence which is maybe blocking that ability to express it in a new environment. So understanding what creates and disrupts the sense of presence may be of very practical importance. Um, the second really important thing is, um, like um, others, I'm using VR now in, in our labs to effectively study people. And we assume when they're in VR, it's a bit like being in the real world, but we could be fooling ourselves in very big ways. So understanding whether people have sense of presence or not and whether it's like the real world is incredibly important. And finally, I think, um, whether you like it or not, I think VR is going to be everywhere in 10 years. I mean, with Meta pushing it down our throats from Facebook, um, Apple are going to bring out one. I think it's going to be everywhere. And so really understanding what it means to be present or not and how that's going to affect the way we encode information is going to be vital. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have about five minutes for questions. If we have questions in the room, we do have one um, from, yes, uh, Professor Friedberg. Um, hi. Uh, uh, with all these um, people who talk a lot about self-representation, I hesitate to say what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> uh, and I didn't hear what Daniel Walpert said at all from the back. So he may have covered some. I didn't. Oh. He may. Uh, he may have covered some of this ground. But it, it was. It was brilliant. <laughs> 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 um, it, it may have. Uh, it may, what I have to say may have something to do with fooling. You will say it has something to do with fooling oneself. But as some of you know, what I've always been interested in is self-representation. -rep in, in virtual spaces, but I've not necessarily been thinking of VR, because VR obviously has a long way to go, but I've always thought about feeling present in, shall we say, a picture. So what are the, t what are the issues at stake here? I think one, Chris, Pete, you are quite right to introduce the notion of a sense of agency, which you sort of didn't really cover. But the other thing that I think is really interesting here, and which I didn't hear anybody touch on, but, uh, touch on, but which I know is, a rich area of research. Mike may have something to say about this or not. But surely the, what happens in to, if we ha have to distinguish between self-representation in virtual spaces, which we deal with even in the lab when you look at spaces in computers and so on and so forth, surely what we need to uh, figure out is the relationship between unconscious presence, as it were, and self-awareness. So I think that a step that we need for this notion that you are talking of, of in, uh, with, uh, this notion of the self uh, feeling of being present in a space is also some way of calibrating the degree of self-awareness that takes place when you feel present in a space. Mm -hmm. So that's just one of the issues which I like. A really interesting paper raised many other issues as well. Thank you. Can I just, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. I mean, I, I, th I think I find myself in agreement with all of that and that's in, I think in line with, with uh, my proposal. So I do emphasize, and perhaps I, I should admit that more explicit, but the role of, of the representation of oneself as an agent to bring in self-representation, right? So my suggestion is that um, spatial and motor immersion is not uh, strictly sufficient to develop as a representation of oneself as oneself. One also has to be able to represent oneself in an agential capacity uh, to achieve that. And so that also relates to your sec the second part of your comment, namely that uh, you could conceive of a creature uh, feeling immersed in an environment and where that could be described in, purely spatial, in a purely spatial way without involving uh, a form of self-representation. And so from there, you can distinguish that from uh, other conditions where self-representation happens, perhaps at various degrees, uh, what you call self-awareness. I think the question of paintings, and especially Dutch paintings of the 17th century, of which you are an expert, is a really interesting question. 
Um, we have one other question from the um, audience on Zoom, and uh, Mike Lampert asks, uh, where does one's own body and clothes fit into self-representation? Say, how does one, how does repeatedly pulling up the sleeve on one's sweater fit into this analysis of self and presence? So the kind of constant interaction with the body, I think, is what this is asking. Right. I mean, that's a good question. We know that in VR, uh, if you have a virtual body and that you can and you can interact with it, so you can have various ways to track your body in a virtual environment and represent it with an avatar. And then, if you're able to touch yourself, for example, touch your own hand, or um, that greatly increases the illusion of being present in the environment. So that would relate to what I I called motor immersion, but uh, perhaps it's a more an even more specific case of it instead of it relating to the the capacity to interact with objects in the environment, it's the capacity to interact with your own body as an, an object uh, embedded in the environment, but a very special object, of course, uh, which is the object with which you move. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, so, yeah, so when, you, when I've used VR, uh, there's a sense in which I'm present in the virtual environment, but also in the real environment. I know that the walls are still here. I know that there's a cable attached to my head. Um, and so at the same time, I know that one is the real world and one is not the real world. And so in your thinking about theories of presence, how do you deal with the fact that you can be present you know, in two environments at the same time? And maybe a more fundamental question is, is presence kind of you know, separable from awareness? Like I can. As I, th I think one of the, uh, the mentors said, I can be completely uh, uh, asleep or my eyes can be, I can be awake but my eyes can be closed and I know I'm kind of present somewhere but I might not know exactly where I am, so yeah. Right, basically. thank you, yeah. So I think there are two, two uh, sides to this comment. Uh, one is the fact that, uh, as I mentioned, when you're in VR, you know indeed that you are not in the environment you're seeing, in the virtual environment, you're perfectly, you're not delusional so you know that you are actually in a room wearing a VR headset and, and so on, or in the lab. Or, uh, so, so that's, that's, uh, that's beyond dispute. And then there is uh, the fact, in, in, as, as you described, that with current VR systems, which are imperfect, uh, especially the ones that, have a, a, that are wired, now you have wireless uh, headsets uh, that are, are more freeing, but uh, they used to have a wire. And uh, there are all of these minor hindrances that take you out of the feeling of immersion. Uh, so I think the feeling of presence in VR right now with the systems we have is a transient feeling, uh, but you will see people, for example, suddenly after being immersed in an environment for a while, trying to lean on a table or doing things like that that suggest that they're really being fooled by the environment, as if only for, for a, brief, a brief moment. But I do think it's, it's still transient. Yeah, we have one other comment, in, um, which is to your point here, which is what do you think about 3D movies that feel somewhere between pictures and virtual reality? A question from Paul Linton. Um, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I think that's a, that's a very uh, interesting case to think about. It's an intermediate case where uh, 3D movies, I mean, it certainly does not feel that you are immersed uh, in the space of the movie in the same way that you are immersed in a virtual environment. Um, Certainly, you don't have any uh, sense of motor immersion, the uh, feeling that you can interact with objects in a 3D movie. Perhaps you have some degree of spatial immersion, though, um, because the, the it, it, it all lines up with your own perspective. You see things coming towards you, and so on. Um, well, I think we have to leave it there. I'm sure you know this. Is, you get a flavor for those of you who are haven't seen this in action. You get a flavor of what the interaction between the mentors and the uh, postdoctoral scholars is like. It's very stimulating. I get to be a very privileged observer to it all, and um, it's really a wonderful conversation. So thank you all very much for your um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am very happy now to introduce um, our second speaker, Dr. Valerio Amaretti, who is a literary scholar who studies how reading and writing affect our mind and brain. In particular, Dr. Amaretti draws from contemporary object relations psychoanalysis to understand the role that literature and narrative play in enabling long-term long -term psychic change and creativity. 
As a presidential scholar, he explores the neural bases for these processes. Dr. Amaretti received his PhD in 2019 from the Columbia University Department of English and Comparative Literature. He has dissertation focused on the psychic work involved in reading modernist fiction. Uh, welcome, Dr. Amaretti. Thank you, Pamela, for your introduction. I think it was so good that I barely have anything to add now. Um, but I will just uh, start by saying that um, for the last many years now, um, coming on to 15, really, uh, I've been um, thinking about psychoanalysis and literature in conjunction, even though I started off in neuroscience a long time ago, and I'm now obviously coming back to it. Uh, but throughout this time, I've really been trying to understand how and why uh, literature moves us in the ways it does. Uh, and I mean that both in reading and in writing at the highest level, and I mean it not just in the acts of reading and writing, but, uh, but over time as well. Um, obviously, this is a lifetime's worth of, of thinking and research. But for this postdoc, uh, my aim is to write a book. Um, and the title of the book is uh, going to be Inventions of the Self. So uh, today, I'll tell you a little bit about one section of the book. Uh, but this is just a those were supposed to animate, and this tells me that probably the rest of the presentation is also not going to animate, but, uh, but that's OK. Um, those are just some notes about what, what the book um, is going to be about. Uh, the main point to make is that uh, I'm trying to characterize reading and writing as a transformative processes that have the potential to modify uh, the way we think about who we are um, and what we are. And the book does so through really quite a sustained analysis of the similarities between the kind of affective intersubjective processes that take place during our interactions with, with literary works and what happens in psychodynamic psychotherapy. So if you want to, this is kind of the key idea behind the book, is to really study this parallel. And as part of that, I zoom in on some uh, what I call creative mechanisms that help us integrate experience into a narrative of the self, uh, or conversely, that kind of may explain why we fail to do so sometimes. And the book obviously asks all of this uh, in, in the context of neuroscience. So I'm interested in the question of, uh, for each psychological process that I study, I, I try to understand how it relates, uh, how it is determined by the neural infrastructure that, that uh, underlies it. And uh, lurking in the background is a question that I regard as somewhat above my pay grade, of course, but it is uh, the question that Raphael was even touching on uh, of, uh, of the nature of the self. And my title gestures towards an idea uh, that I believe that the mechanisms uh, on which uh, psychotherapy is based and perhaps some of our interactions with literature is based uh, may be a pathway to defining uh, the self itself. So the book is, let's see if this animates. Oh, wow, okay. The book is going to have four chapters. Um, I am not going to tell you uh, anything at all really about chapters one and two. They're about reading, two different kinds of reading. Um, but what I want to talk about today actually is chapter Three, the content of chapter three, uh, which essentially describes how um, contemporary therapeutic approaches uh, of the kind I'm interested in seek to create the text, uh, in inverted commas, that allows emergent emotions to be represented. And then I give a little sample of uh, the kind of writers that I talk about in chapter number four, which takes those ideas and brings them on to questions of self-writing, autobiography, and autofiction. So um, my work is really across three disciplines, um, literary studies, neuroscience, and psychoanalysis. Uh, there have been interactions between all of these in the past, and it's a complicated scene. There's some, uh, there's some friendship and also a lot of antagonism. And uh, my idea is to draw a little bit from all and perhaps also to manage to talk about psychoanalysis and neuroscience in the same breath in order to uh, capture that part of literary studies that may be skeptical about one or the other. And this comes in a context of a really busy uh, landscape uh, with just uh, you know, a huge number of uh, sort of subfields, each of which has its own fights and uh, its own preferences and its own definitions. Uh, and I try to navigate uh, all of that as best as I can. Now, this is not really the, the place for a full genealogy of uh, uh, psychoanalytic theory, but let's just say that things splintered a little bit after Freud. And I'm most interested in object relations theory, which is what happened following the work of Melanie Klein. 
And uh, in particular, then when the work of uh, Wilfred Bion, somebody very important to me, um, uh, was uh, updated with intersubjective field theory, which originated from uh, Argentina, uh, and uh, it yielded a bunch of um, uh, very cool contemporary theorists that I refer to as contemporary Bionians. So this is really where my work is. Um, the point of my book is that this school of psychoanalysis, which I think has a lot to offer, hasn't really been interacting with either literature or neuroscience uh, to this day. So this needs to happen. And in fact, uh, you may have seen in the previous slides uh, that there is a project called Neuropsychoanalysis. Uh, that project, on which I'll say a little bit more in a minute, uh, is was literally a, uh, a, a queering of Freud in neuroscientific terms. Uh, but there's no such thing as something that discusses what contemporary object relations theory has to say um, in, in the context of neuroscience. So uh, it's going to be hard for me to explain what's, what's so interesting to me about this new school of psychoanalysis in just a few slides, but um, one quick distinction that I can make uh, with respect to classical Freudian um, therapeutics uh, has to do with the nature of therapeutic change. So if you know anything about Freud, you know that uh, interpretation is really central to how it works. Um, and the other thing that you may have heard about Freud is that the goal of therapy is very often to uh, expand the domain of the conscious ego at the expense of the unconscious uh, world. So this is a famous uh, sentence from, I believe, the ego and the id. Um, in, the, in the cartoon there, you see uh, the psychotherapist, the analyst, is trying to convince the bunny uh, that all its problems date back from having been pulled out of the hat. So again, interpretation, and again, you see that the the, the, the making the bunny conscious of something that is previously unconscious, so the kind of archaeological metaphor, you dig for an old, forgotten, maybe repressed uh, truth, uh, is how uh, Freudian therapy worked. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but uh, things have changed a little bit since Freud. Um, one main change is uh, that interpretation has kind of lost some of its um, importance, and that has been replaced by um, an approach that's more uh, oriented towards play, and uh, nobody captures that better than uh, Donald Winnicott, um, who uh, wrote uh, that psychotherapy is done in the overlap uh, of two play areas, that of the patient and the therapist, and if either of them cannot uh, play, then there can be no therapy. So this is quite a strong kind of statement that puts intersubjectivity also there on the map. Um, I should mention play therapy, of course, started with children. Uh, in the 1930s, and that's because you can't really do interpretation with children. They, they don't uh, take that in uh, just as well as adults. Um, so it started in the 1930s, but now it kind, of, uh, it kind of underpins how we think about therapy in general. The other big change is in the role of dreams, and this is uh, kind of subtle, so I'm going to try to convey it as best as I can. Um, this goes down to the work of uh, Wilfred Bion, uh, but I'm quoting uh, Bion interpreters because Bion himself can be quite hard to uh, hard to decipher. Um, first of all, uh, the first quote up there is by uh, Ogden that makes clear that we now, in psychoanalysis, the people now think about dreaming as something that happens in the background the whole time. Ogden says, the internal conversation known as dreaming is no more an event limited to the hours of sleep than the existence of the stars is limited to the hours of darkness. Uh, instead, the stars are visible at night when the luminosity is no longer concealed by the glare of the sun. Likewise, you could say that dreams become visible at night because uh, the, the stranglehold of uh, attention and consciousness uh, gives up. Now, Freud would kind of have agreed with that, but Bion adds an other part to it, which is that he uh, begins to think of dreams as a mental digestive process, and this digestive metaphor is really, uh, really important. He, uh, uh, he suggests that dreaming does something to the experience uh, and that enables you to turn it into a memory, into something that then you can kind of hold in your own self-narrative. So you see, obviously, the, the, the wording of dreaming is becoming more and more abstract and uh, detached from its kind of uh, vernacular use as we, as we do that. Um, I'm going to try to capture what the change is uh, in a diagram of my own, uh, which is going to be uh, necessarily imperfect uh, 
uh, and I'm kind of choosing terms from different schools to try and make things as readable as I can. Uh, but the core of the post bionian uh, theory revolution is that you start with an affective experience, uh, which you know, we could say it's affect, either an arising endogenously or in response to something in the environment, but it is non-conscious. So it's at least the kind of non-conscious affective part of an experience. And uh, that gets worked on by a sort of psychic function, okay, that I'm going to call dreaming. This is um, a vocabulary that not everybody would agree with, but let's call it dreaming. And it turns, it yields something that uh, they call dream fragments or pictograms. Those are rudimentary basic representations, but they retain an emotional quality to it. So they can be they're primarily non-conscious, but perhaps you sort of see a flash of them in daydreams or reveries or indeed in nighttime dreams, right? So it's an early kind of sometimes conscious, uh, early rudimentary re uh, representation that retains um, a degree of emotional quality. That process then happens all over again at a higher level, um, and uh, we're gonna call that phase thinking. And um, these therapists think that through the process of thinking, you string together those pictograms uh, into a whole narrative, for example, a narrative of yourself or a, a relatable thought or a memory or something that, that you, you, you can be fully conscious of, but it still remains its emotional quality. So a few things to say about this. First of all, this is um, a phenomenology from the point of view of a, of a psychotherapist and not at all a, an implication that there's a biological process that matches this. Um, although it raises interesting questions for neuroscience, and I'll come to that. Um, so it's a digestive process. So the idea being that the affect is transformed as it goes through this machinery. And the, 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 the narrative uh, that you obtain at the end of it is still has its emotional quality. So this is not just a um, acting on the affect, and it's not just a, uh, a readout, but it's a transformation of it. Second important point is that they think that those capacities are acquired during development in intersubjective processes, so uh, in the diet with, uh, with, a, with a mother. And the implication of that is that they retain an intersubjective dimension um, that you can reactivate later, for example, through therapy, and this is where I come in, perhaps in reading and writing. Now, obviously, this um, is a kind of theoretical, uh, sketch from the point of view of psychotherapy, but it mirrors uh, questions and problems that neuroscientists are very, very concerned uh, with. And uh, it's no coincidence that I mentioned earlier the, the, neurosci the, the neuropsychoanalysis project, right? That project was uh, started in, as a journal uh, by Mark Solms in 1999. And in fact, when, when they did the first issue of the journal, the very first issue was um, themed around the idea of asking neuroscientists to comment on Freud's theory of affect. Um, so Solms knew when he started this that this was really prime territory for, for an interaction, but the problem that I have with that is that Freud's theory of affect was not all that interesting. Um, if there's any Freudian purists here that they, may, that they may disagree, and it's a very long conversation, but I think that in a, in a nutshell, Freud really thought that affect had three possible outcomes. One is that it was satisfied, that, uh, that is to say that you acted on it. The other that it was repressed, and then it became a symptom, hence the kind of Viennese hysteric that everybody associates with Freud. And the third possibility is sublimation, which sort of means turn it to an internal object. It's a very complicated discussion, uh, but not too relevant. But I don't think that Freud really uh, thought that um, the process of representing an affect could somehow tame it, that could somehow modify it, right? This is a new a fairly new idea within psychoanalysis and suddenly changes a lot for therapeutics and other aspects. So that's something that, that, uh, that could turn in the hands of a neuroscientist into uh, even some, um, some testable uh, uh, hypothesis. Uh, first of all, about whether there's any value to thinking about this as a function, um, and secondly, about the idea that it happens and it's acquired developmentally and can be tuned up in an intersubjective uh, process. Uh, we know that the neuroscience of affect has kind of uh, thought long and hard about the relationship between sort of subcortical, older uh, parts of the brain uh, affects happening there and, and their representation in the cortex. And, and that's a conversation that's very relevant to what I'm writing and I'm hoping to capture that. Now, I'll, I'll recap a little bit about this part because I want to move towards my final uh, third, which is going to be uh, more about literature. 
Um, but here, let me just say, the shift in psychoanalytic theory that I just summed up uh, really places the emphasis on the mechanisms as opposed to on the nature of the affect. Freud was very concerned about the nature of the affect. The newer th uh, theorists think more about the mechanisms. It also provides the developmental intersubjective perspective um, uh, on how uh, rudimentary psychical representations are formed. Um, and therefore, it accounts for the fact that new and corrective experiences in play in transference, which is the sort of sustained affective relationship between a, a patient and a therapist, have the potential to help therapeutically because they shift the sort of long chain of associations in a way that, uh, that just telling you something that you may have forgotten or repressed uh, does not manage to do. And it also related, the, it de-emphasizes this kind of Freudian imperative to make it conscious, which uh, according to some people would just result in a constant struggle between sort of top-down regulation uh, uh, and bottom-up emotion that has not stopped just because you've been told that it goes back to being pulled out of the hat. And finally, for me, uh, it, the most important part for me is that each of those two processes that I've called dreaming and thinking um, really entail a little bit of, of flexibility and creativity. So they kind of tell you that your conscious experience of yourself is subject to transformation through those sustained, deep, uh, intersubjective interactions. Um, therapy, of course, but perhaps also art and, and literature. And to give you a quick sense of what um, the contemporary uh, Th theoretical landscape does with this. Uh, I'll pull some examples by one of the latest practitioners whose name is Antonino Ferro. Uh, this is a book that came out in 2006. And Ferro describes what a, uh, the practice of uh, therapy looks like from the standpoint of this theoretical, um, these theoretical positions. He writes, um, there's a way of being in the session where analysts and patients share in the construction of a meaning together on a dialogic basis. He says, it's as if analysts and patients were together constructing a drama, and neither is the holder of a strong preconstituted truth. And he calls this process um, co-narrative transformation. So again, notice the, the, the implicit playfulness of this model, and also the uh, explicit intersubjective dimension of this model. It takes two minds to... to to change one. Um, same writer, uh, this is a diagram that I kind of copied from the book, uh, replacing some of the jargon. Um, he says that the field becomes, the field being the, the affective field between patient and therapist, becomes the matrix for the genesis of infinite stories and infinite possible journeys. Um, he says, always provided that those are transformational events and the transformation arises out of the patient's proto-emotions awaiting thinkability. So there's a bit of jargon that snuck in, but what, what he means is that the goal of the therapy is to help a patient fluidify that process that goes from an affective experience th through to a dream fragment and then uh, into narrative possibilities. And the goal of therapy is to play in this kind of prismatic space uh, and uh, explore different ways of thinking about um, oneself. Okay, so this is kind of the theoretical part, and um, and I, I, I love to try and find points of connection between neuroscience and, and psychoanalytic theory for its own sake. Uh, this is what uh, Panksepp called uh, putting psychoanalysis through a crucible of neuroscience, which sounds like a g great project. Uh, and yet at the same time, uh, Ultimately, my goal is to say something that can speak to literary studies, and I suspect that most of the audience for my uh, writing will eventually be uh, back in my home department. So what can this say to, to literary studies? Well, one thing that it can say is that if you're into fiction at all, um, and in you like contemporary literature, you have certainly heard uh, the term autofiction. Uh, which is uh, everywhere, um, and some people really hate it, and some people really like it. In the most basic sense, uh, autofiction refers to um, autobiographies that have a fictional element to them, or else uh, fictions that have a strong autobiographical element to them. And um, it's it's a it's a relatively new genre, and you can say a lot about it in terms of a general cultural context. Um, you could argue that our society is full of uh, simplistic, superficial kind of forms of self-transformations where these processes are, uh, are parodied, like social media, you know, self-help gurus on YouTube and that kind of stuff. Uh, but I actually think that autofiction um, has a rather noble uh, origin because it 
derives from the longer confessional discourse that goes back to Rousseau and Augustine, really. Um, so there are some very, very good practitioners on autofiction, and in my last slide, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some of them and, um, and why I'm interested in them. The first one is uh, Rachel Cusk, who is a British novelist, and Cusk has written many uh, novels. Um, but what, I, what I'm interested in is the fact that she really operated at three different levels of self-writing. She wrote fictional novels where that may be a character that you can tell has, has aspects that are borrowed from her life story. She also wrote straight up autobiography. And in fact, she received enormous pu pushback uh, against one of uh, uh, those in which she spoke very earnestly about motherhood. Um, and then uh, finally, she uh, kind of reinvented the genre of autofiction with a really uh, fantastic uh, trilogy of novels. Throughout, she expressed in no, no unclear terms her ambiguity, uh, sorry, her ambivalence um, with respect to the concepts of, of fiction and, and self-writing. And yet she always managed to come out with a new version of it. So a little bit like in that prismatic diagram, you can find a new thread of narrative possibility that emerges out of the same life story. And the same uh, could be said of uh, this man here as a Nobel Prize winner, uh, J.M. Kutsia, um, whom I've been thinking about for a very long time. And he too had a, a lot of complex thoughts about the relationship of truth and writing and self-writing. Eventually he started writing uh, fictionalized autobiographies in the third person that didn't last long. In fact, then he wrote one that is written from a point of view of a PhD student uh, going through the papers of the late writer J.M. Kutsia, so <laughs> clearly not too, not too close to, to, to fact. Um, there are also books in which a, a Senor C, who is clearly another alter ego, features and another alter ego called Elizabeth Costello. Um, a lot there. Again, many narrative possibilities emanating from the same uh, life story. But perhaps even more interesting is to con consider the opposite case, which is when a writer uh, refuses to write their self uh, in, in, in their fiction. And this would be the case of uh, Samuel Beckett, who um, was very skeptical of narrative in general and laughed at the idea that there could be such a thing as a coherent self, uh, easily identifiable. Um, and yet, that doesn't free him from having emotions. And in fact, in one of his late pieces called Company, uh, which I like very much. Um, this is a really abstract, high-level Cartesian meditation on the nature of the self. And then it's interrupted by this extremely moving blocks of childhood reminiscence that, that come at you in the context of this otherwise um, uh, rather sterile uh, description. Um, and really kind of evoke the image of a dream fragment that is still loaded with significance, pushing and finding its way into a narrative uh, against all odds. So those are some of the problems that I hope to take my theoretical baggage um, and use it against. Okay, thank you. Magnificent presentation that brought together the many rooms in which you have been dwelling um, for, as, as you point out, decades. Um, I want to start just by pointing out the relationality that is at the foundation of much of what Valerio has presented to us. That these are elements of, um, and do we have permission to use the word self in this room? <laughs> I will go ahead and use it, but uh, of course sort of italicized. Um, but the relational basis of the sense of having a self or being a sense, self is something that in Valerio's work comes forth from the inner subjectivity, be it with the therapist in one of the many uh, psychoanalytic settings, uh, with a reader sitting alone at home with a book, thereby making very astute contact with a writer, an author, a creator. Um, so so the, um, the processes that we're thinking of are indeed intimate processes. There, um, I, I didn't hear any Husserl or Merleau-Ponty, but I might could have. 
uh, because the intersubjectivity is indeed the phenomenon whereby two autonomous subjects meet in a third object or a third space. And, and, and so these are the ideas, I think, that we need to, to uh, um, see in, in, in the background. Um, besides relationality is the imaginative, the imagination, the creativity that is part either of the um, beyond play, Winnicott play, or what happens when I read Henry James or what happens when Valerio reads Samuel Beckett, that there is an imaginative process totally uh, 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 created by this so-called self uh, and is the basis for what we, we end up feeling uh, is our home. Uh, I could go on, but I want my colleagues at the table to have a chance. Let me end by uh, quoting Suzanne Langner in, uh, Langer in Philosophy in a New Key. This is 1942, and she reminds us that it's not the answers that are so critical, but the ways in which we formulate the questions. And I think Valerio has shown great courage in formulating the questions. He's, I keep telling Valerio, that's too big a question. You're asking too big a question. And he kind of says, mm, let me keep trying. So let me end there. Thank you so much, um, Professor Sharon. Um, yes, let's see how I can do this in three minutes. Um, we've been talking with Valeria for, for a number of years, and, and the project is always uh, changing in a beautiful way. Uh, I think the key, uh, as he started, the, uh, where he started, the key element um, here is the notion of transformation, uh, which is a dynamic co uh, concept. Uh, a concept that, that um, uh, enacts change, and uh, um, to which the self is subjected, uh, I, to my mind, uh, though the self might be enacting it, in, a, a, in the sense that, um, um, especially since he's interested in intersubjective conditions, uh, he, the self is moved into a relational field, uh, into, let's say, this, the field uh, of otherness, if not the, f the field of the other. Uh, and uh, in this respect, um, he sets up um, a sort of a parallel um, situation between, on the one hand, the analytic session, um, which is a certain performative session between self and other, uh, and um, the, um, the, the situation of reading and writing, um, which um, again is not just about reading books per se, uh, I, I would argue, but has to do much more with reality. Uh, in any case, insofar as he's talking literature, uh, the reading and writing in, co in, uh, in relation to, to fictional states. Um, fictional states in this respect, if it's seen in, in, in this parallel formation, is uh, very close to uh, you know the concept of reality as an affective state. In fact, much of what uh, Raphael you did uh, it was very resonant in this respect. Uh, um, you know the uh, affective sense of reality is, is is what's going on in both situations. So um, this um, in, in this in this context he uh, uh, reaches into the notion of dreams, the process of dreaming. Um, which I think would be essential, um, especially given the Bionians who argue uh, that dreaming is a constant process, a kind of background process in everything that we do. Now, I was thinking, um, you know, if we uh, allow ourselves this sort of thing, it's rather strange these days, to go back to Freud uh, for a minute and, and remember that, um, indeed, uh, for Freud, uh, you know, what he called dream thoughts, um, where, where um, in essence, um, you know, um, image thoughts, denk builder is a term. So even if Freud said, even when there are words uh, in dreams or, or there's, or there's talking, uh, interaction with people in, in verbal form, uh, it doesn't matter, it, uh, all of these things are images. And uh, if we imagine then a kind of uh, sort of background of constant flux of of images uh, which are not necessarily visual because they're primarily affective and dynamic, right? Uh, they're 
only not just simply representations of reality, but kind of presentations of the psyche in relation to reality. Uh, then we have a, we have a very interesting um, um, dynamic uh, uh, um, f uh, frame in which we can think about um, the issue of, of uh, intersubjective um, uh, relation, and uh, in in its in, in this sense, we come back to the to the beginning. Uh, the notion of creativity um, is is something that is very much linked to transformation. If we think of creativity, I think from the literary perspective, certainly as something that is uh, what a, you know poetic in in according to the ancient Greek sense of poesis, which is indeed uh, the creation of forms, and and it is uh, a, a transformative process, poesis. Uh, for me, um, um, even if not directly for Valero, although I know that's in, in, in his soul, that's also the case, um, th the significance of this is much greater than simply literature, literary studies. Because uh, if, if, in fact, w we are talking about the self as a transformative uh, domain in an intersubjective process, we are opening it up to all kinds of, of things that matter a great deal in the world we live in, particularly, of course, having to do with society uh, and politics, et cetera. Thank you very much, Professor Gregorius. Professor Shadlin? Uh, thank you. Um, Valerio, thanks again for um, putting all this effort in and um, putting up with um, a little bit of neuroscience. Um, so I, I, I can't resist a, a, a philosophical aside that the self, in my view, is a derivative of the uh, dyadic I-thou. So I would marry Buber with Merleau-Ponty and try to and uh, try to see that at the heart of, or the mind of, of um, all of the kinds of, um, of um, dyads that you, that you shared with us. Um, so I'm just gonna make a few neuroscience points for you. Um, so first of all, it's self-evident to me anyway that non-conscious ideation precedes conscious expression and awareness. I think you hold that view. And so in a sense, reading and writing are ways to bring things to the forward much as um, to, to the foreground, I meant to say, as much as, um, uh, as much as the interaction between the therapist and the patient, presumably. Um, and so I, I really think that that's a, that's a direction you could take things and make, uh, and make a connection to the neuroscience in more than a metaphorical kind of way. Um, so, you know, reading and writing um, are a bit like understanding and expressing, a bit like gnosis and praxis. And so these are think ways to think about the organization of the brain and, um, and also uh, some of the things that we do in order to um, improve our, or improve our, our, our ideas. Um, um, the, we, we've had discussions about non-conscious thought and how sophisticated it is or isn't. And uh, in your fragment, I, I think you called it, um, of uh, moving into, um, into consciousness, um, I think that um, you do a disservice to, or you could, you could do, uh, let's let me put it more positively, that you could do, give the non-conscious mind a lot more um, power by uh, recognizing that it's very sophisticated and therefore makes use of things that um, you, I think you've left off, you've, you've placed off limits like working memory and because um, without that there would be no sophistication of any of our non-conscious ideations and of course, we wake up with theorems proven in our heads, so we know that we're capable of these things. So, um, uh, not that I've ever woken up with a theorem in my head, but, um, but um, uh, a anyway, so uh, I think that a useful guide for in is to, uh, again, uh, distinguish between uh, metaphor, simile, phenomenology, and mechanism. And I think that, would, that might help you a bit in moving forward. Um, and so finally, I'll just close with a point that came up actually with the uh, music thing we did here Friday, and that is that this notion of play that uh, I find very um, uh, intriguing in, your, in your, uh, our conversations and hopefully your writing, um, and that is that you know, play is in a sense a way of, 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 of getting beyond our current knowledge in, uh, in the form of intuitions. And I think they do involve a certain amount of trust. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I think um, that that's, um, that's uh, sort of the, uh, the implied communication with, between artist and beholder, and also presumably patient and therapist. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shadlin. Uh, do we have questions? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, amazing talk. I'm so excited to see where uh, your research and work goes. 
Um, I'm gonna apologize in advance for the depth of this question, but as somebody um, really interested in education, um, I, I can't help but ask it and bring our attention to it. So um, there was a, a psychologist in um, Soviet Union, early Soviet Union, uh, named Vygotsky, um, who said two things that I think are really relevant to our conversation. One is that um, thought is not evidenced, but completed in the word, spoken or written. Uh, and two, that play is imitation of what we cannot yet do. Uh, but making meaning of that play is the fundamental human activity. Uh, so I think that those are valuable and relevant. Also valuable and relevant um, is uh, Davidson's work uh, in um, uh, Minis no, sorry, Wisconsin, um, who studies uh, monks and their healthy minds, so to speak. And one of the points that he makes um, is that those healthy minds, the most advanced monks, have an incredibly small amount of, if, uh, if any, uh, sort of self midline processing um, in the brain uh, under various activities, and I think that's um, valuable to consider. Finally, the question, um, <laughs> which I just want to push you on because I think was such a, a great direction to think in, um, is, is how is literature learning or learning through literature overlapped with this psychoanalysis uh, or, or therapy um, activity? So is the narrative transformation that you mentioned a necessary component of healthy or balanced or integrated development? Or uh, does psychoanalysis take advantage of a highly developed skill for reconstruction of any concept, self-representation being one of them. You have 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, well, uh, uh, for in 30 seconds. You can take a minute, yeah. <laughs> this is a, this is a fantastic uh, question. In 30 seconds, I can only suggest that we should continue it uh, <laughs> elsewhere. But, um, okay, now I, I, I've almost forgotten this, this final part. I'll just speak to the final part about the, the relationship with literature. Um, it's complicated to put it in kind of <laughs> <laughs> Facebook terms, okay? But one point of doing this is that I think when you come uh, towards literature with this big theory of the self kind of um, apparatuses, uh, you can take on questions that are not ordinarily uh, discussed within literary studies, uh, such as, you know, quite simply, why do are there such disparate approaches to the writing of the self across different writers, and not from a sort of psychobiography point of view and going into the history of a specific writer, but as an expression of just like, those are the, the, the range of ways in which our minds can uh, think about the self in writing and make art out of it. And uh, I feel like this kind of huge question, and you know, everybody pointed out that my questions tend to be on the on the large side. Um, I believe deserves a, a whole psychological theory, um, but the truth is also that I'm trying to cram in a lot into a very short presentation, and I hope that the individual sort of paper length chunks of the book will take on much more um, precise and, and 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 you know constrained uh, sets of questions. Um, so I hear you, but w we should definitely talk more about all the other things that you mentioned. Thank you. Great. I'm afraid we have to leave it there, although I, I will say that, um, you know, all of the questions that came up here, the kind of background, we will continue in mentor meetings and beyond. So um, thank you all so much, both for your mentoring and your presentations today. Thank you. I'm thrilled to introduce our last speaker today, Dr. Claire McCormick. Um, she has finished her um, postdoc and um, she has focused for her postdoc on women's psychological health in pregnancy and the peripartum and how these experiences are affected by maternal stress and trauma. She received her PhD in public health in 2016 from the National Drug and Alcohol Research Center at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, where she studied alcohol use during pregnancy and infant cognitive development. Dr. McCormick has wonderfully recently joined NYU Langone's Department of Child and As Adolescent Psychiatry as a research scientist. So congratulations, um, Dr. McCormick, and welcome. Thank you, Pamela. Um, and so since this is my final presentation with Presidential Scholars, I've been asked to talk about my work leading up to joining the program and an overview of my time with PSSN and just some reflections on interdisciplinary research in general, and I'm very happy to be doing this today. Uh, and so to start more or less at the beginning, 
After studying psychology, I completed my PhD in public health at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. And there I was focusing on effects of alcohol use during pregnancy on infant cognitive development with the assumption that alcohol use was harmful and the goal was we were going to clarify effects of exposure to alcohol at lower levels. Um, but to cut right to the uh, chase and the, the um, outcome of this research, what we actually found was that children born to mothers who drank at low levels during pregnancy performed better on cognitive development assessments than those born to mothers who didn't drink. And this persisted no matter what level of statistical uh, method was used to adjust for all manners of confounders that we had in this, it, this um, huge data set. And it turns out that actually this was the pattern seen uniformly across now dozens of similar large prospective cohort studies. Um, and this data and these results might seem surprising, and, to, and I'm certainly not up here advocating that women should drink alcohol during pregnancy to bump up their baby's IQ, obviously. But really, we look at data like this and conclude that surely this must be a function of other environmental factors that are related to drinking alcohol. Um, and drinking, it turns out, is really more common among women who are older, more highly educated, and earning higher income. So things associated with advanced, uh, more advanced infant development on their own. But where this becomes puzzling is looking at these, uh, for example, two meta-analyses side by side and seeing that children who go on to be diagnosed with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are actually more likely to have mothers with lower educational attainment, lower income, and to be unemployed. So by, uh, how could it be that those who are most at risk of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are not the same as those who are most at risk of being exposed to alcohol in pregnancy? So just by the exact same token, it's reasonable to interrogate studies that report deficits in children following exposure to substances and consider how certain we are about the causality in these cases too. It's clearly not a simple uh, story of causality relative to other forms of environmental adversity. And to really highlight this, a paper published recently using data from the Adolescent uh, Brain Cognitive Development Study, or ABCD study, which is the largest study of its kind in the US with about 10,000 children. Um, it made some headlines because prenatal alcohol use was correlated, um, even at low levels, with increased risk for maternal report of child psychopathology. And they concluded that there was evidence for harm um, following exposure to even low levels of drinking, which is valid because there was a statistically significant correlation. But the beauty of the ABCD study is that the data is publicly available. And um, this other paper using data from the exact same sample used a more data-driven approach of principal component analysis and showed that this association shown in the middle with the long um, red box it pales in comparison, literally on this heat map, um, when looked at next to the effect of parental psychopathology on child psychopathology and socioeconomic conditions on cognitive development. So taken together, these two studies from the ABCD cohort demonstrate that the way that we frame research questions and then the choice of analytic methods used can lead to quite different conclusions. So I've argued since that maternal depression, stress and anxiety, um, they are by far the biggest predictors of childhood emotional and behavioural problems and they also happen to be uh, the biggest predictors of alcohol use and substance use. So it follows that access to pre prenatal psychological care would really be the more logical target for improving health both of women and the next generation. But it's not really convenient to find yourself finishing a PhD and questioning the entire premise of your research that you started with. But that is actually where I was. So it made sense to think about substance use in context and take a broader view about what kind of environmental factors were important for child development. So the developmental origins of health and disease paradigm, or DOHAD, now underlies a large field devoted to understanding how experiences before birth shape development. And this is what led me initially to Columbia and to Dr. Catherine Monk's lab, the Perinatal Pathways Lab, which investigates how pregnant women's experiences like depression, stress, medication, nutrition, how they shape fetal and infant neurobehavioral development. 
And so thanks to research, including Dr. Monks, we, we now understand that maternal depression and stress during pregnancy can be considered exposures to the fetus that, uh, that affect things like birth outcomes, infant temperament and neurodevelopment with consequences for uh, child development and child psychopathology. And it seems that we can even trace developmental origins back even further than in utero. Experiences of previous generations can actually affect the next generation. So intergenerational trauma is a phenomenon felt by descendants of traumatized people and is traceable in biology. And the study of intergenerational trauma via biological mechanisms has really become an extension of the science of developmental origins. There are so many potential threads to follow in looking for mechanisms at play in the biological embedding of adversity and pathways of, for transmission to the fetus. We can look at mother's genetics, the immune system, cortisol stress response, endocrine functioning, diet, brain structure, IQ, and how these things are shaped by adversity, such as mother's childhood maltreatment, and how all these things interact with one another. So as far as topics for a postdoc go, there are no shortage of research questions to choose from. One mechanism that I want to highlight is via altered maternal psychological and behavioral states during pregnancy. And so to unpack this, it means that a history of trauma can affect things like stress and mood during pregnancy, and that this in turn is what affects gestational biology. And related is the known associations between early life adversity and risk for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Um, and, how, and these disorders, it's known, can, uh, can severely affect the well-being of, of the dyad, the maternal infant unit. Um, and is among the leading risk fac risks for poorer childhood social and emotional development. The implication then is that effectively treating or ideally preventing perinatal mood and anxiety disorders would be one way to interrupt perpetuation of adversity across generations. And obviously uh, treating or preventing these disorders is important to reduce suffering for women too. <laughs> Um, but the trouble is, it looks like common treatments for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are less effective among women who have histories of trauma. And this is consistent with treatment for mood disorders outside of pregnancy too. We therefore need trauma-informed interventions to support pregnant women, and people have really been emphasising this, um, and by extension their children. So, to, but to figure out what these interventions should target, what they might look like, we need to gain a clearer understanding of how pregnancy and the transition to motherhood are experienced for those who are survivors of trauma, especially among underrepresented groups who it is established are at higher risk for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Um, a lot of lab-based work in this area has also been limited to looking at effects of, rel of less severe forms of distress in relatively high functioning populations. So, um, the degree to which these translate is not, it's also not entirely clear. Also, if psychological research is going to take intersectionality seriously, there's a call to come up with, uh, and to heed the call for trauma-informed interventions, a broad spectrum of research methods will be necessary to allow the needs of groups um, experiencing multiple forms of adversity to be represented. And intersectional thinking about participants often leads researchers to engage more with qualitative methods, um, as well as interdisciplinary perspectives in, in the research process. And there's an opportunity in moving this research forward to empirically examine um, this, phenomenal, this phenomenon from psychoanalysis that's been called ghosts in the nursery referring to ways in which past trauma, especially interpersonal trauma, seems to be especially significant um, psychologically during pregnancy and the transition to motherhood. Well, I should just say, um, I was concerned about and uh, moving, I wanted to move ahead with this research and investigating uh, mechanisms for, the, transi for uh, the transmission of trauma across generations, but, um, was concerned about research that may be um, limited just, in, just to the neuroscience being overly reductionist. And some validation for this concern, an argument for a multidisciplinary, multi-level approach to this research comes from Kendler. And he said when speaking of the problem of biological reductionism that is seen in a lot of psychiatric research, that our field may be in particular need of integrative pluralism where scientists, without abandoning conceptual rigour, 
across borders between different etiological frameworks or levels of explanation, and that such efforts may be unusually scientifically fruitful and work bit by bit toward broader integrative paradigms. For me, it meant pursuing the core research questions I was interested in about parenting in the face of trauma and adversity, and how stress and trauma impact perinatal mental health and the dyad, but doing this across multiple levels of understanding. The different methods that I use include so qualitative methods, attending to the lived experiences of women, um, identifying areas of unmet needs um, is part of this, hypothesis generation for future studies, um, identifying important risk and resilience factors and control variables, um, quantitative data, so using self-reports about documenting trajectories of stress and mood symptoms across pregnancy, um, behavioral studies, so observing real-world behavior and lining this up against child outcomes, um, as well as women's mental health to establish whether behavioral parenting focus interventions are appropriate. And then neuroimaging, so neuroimaging accesses things not available to conscious awareness. And this um, arm of the research builds on emerging neuroscience, supporting the idea that pregnancy is a developmental period in adulthood. So the brain, it turns out, actually changes dramatically in structure and function over pregnancy and the postpartum months. And this largely is a good thing. It supports the transition to motherhood um, and enables the development of caregiving behavior and coping with parenting stress. We do need to understand, though, more about individual differences that shape brain changes over this period with a goal to ultimately investigate whether adaptive brain changes during pregnancy may be disrupted in trauma survivors. So the populations included in my research uh, were both healthy women attending general antenatal clinic at the Columbia Medical Center, as well as a spe specifically targeted sample of women who are survivors of gender-based ba gender violence coming from the Bronx Family Justice Center. And although data collection on the project was uh, pretty severely impacted by the pandemic, which hit right in the middle of recruitment, um, it eventually picked up again, so I will share some of the emergent findings just briefly. Firstly, that maternal trauma history was associated with elevated symptoms of depression, anxiety, and distress during pregnancy. Differences were especially pronounced in pregnancy-specific distress, which refers to a range of worries and concerns to do with the experience of being pregnant itself. Um, maternal trauma history is also associated with a trajectory of depression symptoms that begins earlier during pregnancy. And this in itself could be clinically meaningful because postnatal depression is a vastly heterogeneous disorder and um, there are different phenotypes of postnatal depression which may be linked to different underlying causes and point to potentially different uh, treatment options being more effective. So for example, um, some of the interventions currently are more focused on preparedness for the baby or parenting techniques. But because we're seeing um, in this population that some distress experienced by women with histories of trauma is actually more related to proximal concerns with pregnancy itself, it follows that such interventions might be less effective in, in these groups. Next, looking at parenting-related outcomes, in the early postpartum months, maternal trauma history was actually not associated with any decreased maternal sensitivity in observed or self-reported parenting. And there was also no difference in theory of mind ability, so a measure of advanced social cognitive ability, which is thought to underlie sensitive caregiving behavior. And overall, this suggested to me that it, at least in this uh, relatively high functioning group of mothers, but who did have a significant history of, tra of trauma, they're not lacking in any core parenting ability compared to those without uh, such a history. They were, however, more stressed during their pregnancies and continued to be at higher risk for depression beyond the postpartum months. Um, also, interestingly, among women with histories of trauma only, distress during pregnancy was associated with more self-reported hostility during the postpartum, reflecting some level of uh, resentment towards a child or to the transition to parenthood in general that is felt by the mother. But again, this was not visible in any observer-rated mother-baby interactions and overall, the findings would point to alleviating uh, prenatal distress um, as being the trauma-informed approach to improving women's mental health in the peripartum. 
So this quantitative data does give some support to coming back to the idea of ghosts in the nursery in the sense that, yes, we can see that uh, a history of trauma is associated with elevated distress uh, during the perinatal period. But really, it's qualitative data that gives us the most direct insight into the, the sort of hows and the whys of this. So um, in what ways can remnants of past trauma sort of interrupt the experience of, of transition to parenthood, including creating a new identity as a mother and uh, forming mental representations of infants. And so a series of in-depth narrative interviews were conducted with women from both the Bronx Family Justice Center and from Columbia Medical Center in either English or Spanish. And to just briefly say a bit about the method used, um, the listening guide from Gilligan outlines steps for a voice-centered relational approach to analyzing qualitative data. It's a, a method that attends to both psychological processes and also to social and cultural contexts. Uh, it does incorporate elements of thematic and narrative analysis and grounded theory, but really the process differs. So it specifies a series of separate listenings or close readings of transcripts, beginning with listening for the plot, but then moving on to listening specifically for the voice of the I or the first person voice um, of the speaker. And then finally listening for contrapuntal voices, the other voices that are present in a narrative that speak to the research question. And it won't really be possible to describe the outcomes in any satisfying level of depth here, but I can give an outline of the main um, emergent themes so far. So this firstly includes themes related to the pregnant self in the context of trauma, including in many cases ambivalence towards motherhood in general. Also a, a fear for their own health and well-being during this period, during this transition and often a, quite a pronounced uh, feeling of vulnerability, shame and dissociation, especially in the delivery room. And sometimes this was um, directly attributed to um, memories or past experiences of uh, interpersonal trauma. Second, the social context was at the core of many narratives where the voice of any number of others actually dominated people's stories rather than the self. And sometimes this other was an abusive partner or an ex-partner. Sometimes it was the literal presence or even just the memory of a parent or grandparent or someone from the past. And women varied in their level of perceived power and agency relative to others in their world. And this influenced um, how they experienced this transition. And finally, positive change through motherhood was often described. Uh, this was a clear turning point in the lives of many. But sometimes an element of this was the support and love that came from the child itself being something to lean on, which was sometimes but not always paired with a recognition that this may not be an ideal dynamic for a parent-child relationship. And finally, I have just concluded a, a pilot neuroimaging study of mothers scanned during postpartum months. Um, I wish I had data to show already, but it's being processed right now. Um, after the pandemic pushed data collection much later than planned. So as part of a larger protocol, mothers listened to recordings of their own baby cry sounds, other baby cry sounds and matched white noise. And this was based on studies demonstrating that among humans, there are common uh, behavior repertoires and specific corresponding activated brain regions in caregivers that constitute primary responses to infant distress. So the infant cry sound is a very powerful stimuli. Um, some, so far, some studies have described individual differences in patterns of responses to these sounds in the context of maternal depression and poverty. So now the aim of this study is to examine the paradigm in the context of maternal trauma. Importantly, these mothers also completed the in-depth narrative interviews, cognitive assessments, as well as observer-rated mother-infant interactions. So it's really becoming a, a unique and a very rich data set that allows us to potentially triangulate uh, things seen at the level of the brain, self-narrative, and behavior. I want to say a bit more about presidential scholars now. Um, I mean, it's quite rare for postdocs to have the chance to work across multiple disciplines and to be able to approach research in this big picture way as I have. Um, so I feel very fortunate. 
my mentors, Catherine, Rita, and Nim, are really a dream team of people who individually are already interdisciplinary thinkers and of obviously each leaders in their respective fields. Um, I felt that for a project like this, I did need to draw on psychiatry, obstetrics and gynecology, psychology and developmental neuroscience, and even medi and medical humanities um, to do this research any justice. So even just from a practical standpoint, I think this research benefited from the tangible support from these three areas. And then of course, the amazing thing about PSSN is that I bring these three people into the same room to talk about my research and other things. And it might sound difficult maybe to uh, balance three ha having three mentors as a postdoc, but I actually think it's, it was very natural and constructive because, you know, uh, e each was slightly more involved with one aspect of this big project, and it meant keeping some kind of equilibrium and constantly checking whether ideas coming from one stream were compatible with another. And I also think it's worth highlighting um, amazing female leadership and mentoring, even in the field that I'm pursuing work in, focus on women's mental health and intergenerational trauma, it wasn't a major area of research until quite recently. So I think it's worth acknowledging women who are trailblazers in medicine, neuroscience and social sciences to even open these avenues for investigation. I also think a really important part of bridging disciplinary divides is through communication, including communication to a public audience. And so the seminars I've had the chance to coordinate and moderate through PSSN have really been highlights and mean that you know we're, we're taking ch opportunities to talk to the populations that we're often talking about. Um, so next, as Pamela mentioned, I am moving to a new home just downtown at NYU Langone. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to follow a lot of the same uh, research thread threads that I lay the groundwork for here, here with PSSN. Um, and all the rich data that I gathered right up until my last day um, obviously forms a basis for publications and proposals in the works. But even just a few weeks in, uh, I'm realizing how incredibly fortunate I am to come with the backing of three plus years with PSSN. Um, I think maybe on reflection that being a postdoc was the perfect time to have had this interdisciplinary exposure because we have enough research experience and questions behind us um, you know, to, to, to build a program of research, but we're still really finding out our lane academically and actually have room to incorporate um, different ways of thinking in work going forward. And finally, just in addition to my mentors, I have to thank so many people at Columbia who've been part of this time with me in one way or another from the Center for Science and Society, the Zuckerman Institute, the Perinatal Pathways Lab and the Department of Psychiatry at the Medical Center and the Developmental and Effective Neuroscience Lab in Psychology. And of course, um, all the wonderful presidential scholars from the past and present. Thank you. Um, so I would say that Claire was the best person to do this study. <laughs> I mean, you can hear all the methods, modalities, data, difficult populations that she worked with, and she was just incredibly impressive at pulling it all together. I think that she balances well scientific rigor, an inquisitive nature, and optimism. And I really think you need that optimism um, to, to do this type of study. But what I want to comment on, what I appreciated most about um, Claire's approach was her bridging together the highly quantitative measures with the qualitative assessments of childhood adversity. Um, this is really, really important. I think that Claire was really addressing a big need in the literature. The way that we often assess childhood adversity is often woefully unsatisfying. Um, and this is because um, we often rely on checklist type questionnaires as if these are single events um, that we can count up and uh, get a sense of what the impact of those events were on an individual. But the truth is, as Claire's work has shown, um, early adversity is really complex. Um, uh, first of all, uh, 
we may say that an individual has uh, an, uh, one event of uh, physical maltreatment during development. Uh, first of all, polyvictimization is the norm. Um, and so uh, we're really not talking about a single event. But more importantly, and I think this is where Claire's work comes in, um, an adverse uh, event inevitably, in the case of humans, leads to a cascade of multiple adverse events. So if we take the example of a child who experienced physical maltreatment, you can imagine the number of things that are likely to ensue. So for example, the day that the teacher asks what that bruise is from, mm -hmm. the day you got found out in school, um, the day that Child Protective Services right. knocked on your door, um, the potential threat or actual threat of being separated from your parent who even though there may have been a case of maltreatment you are still deeply attached to and so on and how those chains of events lead to the types of representations that we walk around with as adults and I think that's what's been very powerful um, about the narratives that that Claire has collected. Um, so it's for these reasons that I really just admire Claire um, and her contributions to this important research area. Overall, I've found her, I've learned uh, that she's a very brave researcher, a very thoughtful and very forward-thinking researcher, which, and I anticipate that she's going to bring all of these attributes and more to her new faculty position. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharon. So I will, I will continue where, where Nim left off um, and say a few things about Claire, first as an investigator um, and then as a person committed to justice and equity in health. Um, conceptually, methodologically, I want to add one um, uh, characteristic to your litany uh, of, 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 of Claire's. I think she has uh, an astonishing amount of skepticism to add to the passion for the different approaches so that there was no, there was no um, polarizing, there, there was no polarizing in her equal commitment to the survey data, the the behavioral data, the, observa the observation data, um, and now the MR data that is coming out, uh, and the qualitative data and the interviews. It was as if she were several persons in one, forget self, let's forget self. <laughs> There's a collectivity here within this uh, investigator um, that, that allowed her to bring equal attention and skepticism to each of the spheres in which she worked. Uh, now, I'm a narratologist, so I know particularly what she was able to do in the qualitative narrative ends. Um, she is a reader who knows how to follow form as well as plot. Not all scientists can do that. Uh, as we read very closely, hundreds of times sometimes, these interviews with very traumatized women, uh, she was able to s search out and identify uh, some of the real, some of the, the, the very nuanced complexities. Uh, some of you will know Carol Gilligan, of course. We used Gilligan's approach. To, uh, to our investigations of the interviews. Carol Gilligan is the psychologist from Harvard in 1984 who publishes in a different voice. She was the first to really pay attention to how little girls differ from how little boys in terms of their relationships and their sense of value. Uh, I'm taking more than three minutes. Um, the values, commitments, and ideals go along with what I've just been saying about the investigator qualities. And I can, I can sum it up by saying that she is absolutely committed in a most naive way to a better world 
to a world where there be less violence toward women. Um, so this is, this is what we have, um, we, should feel very, we should feel very proud that we have raised this astonishing investigator. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharon. I couldn't agree more. We should feel very proud. You should feel very proud as mentors. And I want to just read um, the uh, comments of your last mentor, uh, Dr. Catherine Monk. And I'm going to embody her here. Claire, your presentation, which I had the pleasure to preview, beautifully demonstrates your de developmental trajectory from prenatal programming studies focused on in utero alcohol exposure to accomplished researcher on motherhood and trauma. In your current work, you now weave together methodologies from neuroscience, psychology, feminist studies, narrative medicine, and psychoanalytic theory, giving equal attention to quantitative and qualitative approaches to understand lived experience and generate new knowledge. During your PSSN fellowship, you have seemingly, effortlessly moved between different disciplines and as a result are well positioned to advance the broad field of interdisciplinary work. Your recently acquired unique skill set is timely as the National Institutes of Health is becoming more attuned to advantages of qualitative methods such as that data based on coded interviews and other protocols pulling out more nuanced and individual experiences is valued as a part of traditional grant applications alongside quantitative studies reporting on the average experience. With your new research position at NYU Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Department, for which I congratulate you, <laughs> you are on a path to be a trailblazer, someone working in academic medicine who moves outside of the traditional silos to draw on literature and methods from many different disciplines. Kudos to you for working so hard and so independently for leveraging all that the PSSN Fellowship has to offer. I will miss working closely with you, though love that you will be just downtown in our wonderful city. That's from Catherine Monk. Um, so with that, do we have questions? We do have one on here. Oh, thank you. Ah, please. Yeah. Uh, it's on. Hello. Um, Claire, I, did you get any sleep over the <laughs> last three years? I'm, I'm just astonished by the, uh, the range of um, data that you collected. And I also was really impressed that you have the qualitative data because, you know, that is just not something that we see enough of. And it could really change the way we interpret the quantitative data. So my, my question about the qualitative results that you showed us, one thing I wasn't quite sure about was whether these themes were, you derive these themes by comparing those with trauma or not, so that you know this is a theme that you'll see with the women who have experienced trauma versus not, or were they common across all women? Because some, some of the points did seem like, you know, n things that would happen to all people who are pregnant and right. so that, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. So I think one way that um, the qualitative data might become really helpful is that there is variation in the degrees to which, uh, you know, people who have experienced maltreatment will resolve trauma or not. And um, unfortunately, experiences of childhood maltreatment are actually very common. So I, yeah. I didn't really put um, numbers on my yeah. quantitative slides, but in the samples we work with, it was something like, depending on different cutoffs you use on childhood trauma questionnaires, something like 40% could fall into the category of having trauma exposure. Um, so I think within the, if, if, that if trauma exposed women is one group, um, actually the majority who completed these interviews technically fell into that category. I see, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but what we saw is a lot of variation in the degree to which trauma can, is, is resolved, um, whether that's through therapy or other ways of, you know, re re developing good reflective ability, re reflective functioning, yeah. Great, thank you very much. Other questions from the audience? We have one more quick question. Um, from the audience. This is a super interesting topic of research. I only just graduated high school, so my question probably oh. comes from lack of understanding of <laughs> neuroscience. 
but I was wondering about how, in, how intergenerational trauma can be transferred to the fetus when the brain is still developing. I thought this would happen after the baby was born through parenting, but the, is there a biological change in the baby's brain during pregnancy? Um, <laughs> yes, and yes. I know that can sound really scary, but yes. I mean, this is th where those, uh, there are biological pathways through inflammation, uh, through epigenetic mechanisms, so I think you know, some of the uh, first studies that got a lot of people's attention were Rachel Yehuda's work around um, cortisol responsivity in among those who are born to uh, Holocaust survivors. So there is a difference in the way that uh, children who are born to Holocaust survivors uh, respond to stress in terms of their cortisol levels. I don't think I would have known much about that when I was in high school either. Um, <laughs> but just to say that it, it, it could be so, uh, something that you do see at the level of biology. Yeah. Great. Um, do we have any other questions? Well, with that, I will say um, thank you so much to you, Claire, to your mentors. Congratulations again. Um, and thank you. And with that, um, we will call it a night. I do want to say that the Presidential Scholars Program um, would not be p possible without the support of the leadership at Columbia, as well as our valued steering committee members, uh, many of whom are here, faculty from across the university who mentor our scholars. Thank you all so much. It's such a privilege and you know, so stimulating to work with not only the scholars, but also the mentors. Um, we also have many scholars, many um, uh, faculty here who volunteer to review our scholars when we are doing applications like we are, do, are um, now. And I just want to say thank you, not only to all of you for coming today and listening and taking an interest in these fascinating projects, but also to all of the faculty across the universities from all the schools of the university who have helped to make this program a real model of interdisciplinary achievement. And um, we were very happy to have you here today. I want to say thank you to Rafael, to Valerio, to Claire, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>